For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. This is a second interview with Jeffrey Keene. I talked to him before about his reincarnation experience, so this time we're going to recap that a little bit. But I also wanted to include some of his meditation experiences as well. And some of that actually involved getting some information and some suggestions from psychics. With the uh, psychics, I would go sometimes, I would just sit down in front of them and not tell them anything. And I said to one woman one time, give me the most recent past life, and bam, she did. The book Fire in the Soul, Jeffrey Keene. I saw you recently with William Shatner, The Unexplained. That was an excellent presentation and a real nice summary of your experience. Did they just call you and say, hey, let's put this together? What happened? That's pretty much it. We're doing this, and I don't know if you want to be involved in it. And, uh, I had done a William Shatner show out of uh, Canada uh, called Weird or What. Uh, there's still videos on, online of that, too. It was the most money I ever made telling my story. They paid for my trip, you know, the, the uh, car down to the airport. Of course, I had to sit in the airport for quite a few hours. You know, they make you come ahead of time. Then I had to sit on the plane for six hours, get out to L.A. Then I had to go to my hotel room where I sat for one day. And the next morning, went with them 45 minutes or so outside the city, which turned out to be a mistake. What they wanted to do was get away from the noise of the city. But what they didn't know that day was the airport had changed the flight patterns and the, and the airplanes were going right over the house we were recording in. A lot of that you see on TV, they had to piece things in because they couldn't use some of the stuff I had said there or they'd have me repeat it and all that. And I think it uh, interfered with my story. You know my story. You read the book. You know all the involvement with the uh, pain in the face in the, in the hospital with the report and all they left a lot of the strongest evidence out of it. But I think that may also be my fault because when I was talking to them, I mentioned Claire Sylvia. Claire Sylvia wrote a book called Change of Heart. She had a heart-lung bypass. And afterwards, like many transplant recipients have, they have strange feelings, thoughts, and stuff. Claire started having cravings for beer and McNuggets, and come to find out the donor had died on a motorcycle and was fond of beer, and in his pocket at the time he, he was in the accident, he had uh, uh, McNuggets. So she was picking up cellular memory from the organs she had gotten, and I was telling the people out there in California that I can go her one better. I have cellular memory from a past life. If you notice on that program, they had a pretty good big section on people in the cellular memory stuff. So I think they might have cut part of my story (laughs) to put that other stuff in. So sometimes I need to keep my mouth shut, I guess. Okay, the book is Fire in the Soul. And then the the story that you have that is, is so incredible is the fact that of all the kinds of things that tag you as a reincarnation legitimate story, your face, you have the features, you have the scars, the placement of the scars, the memories that you had that were absolutely spot on. I mean, this is textbook case for proof of survival after death when you first put the dots together was it a relief or was it encouraging what happened when you realized i'm here a second time the first part of it after seeing the seeing the photo of john gordon and the resemblance to myself and everything that got a little strange and a little scary and things started adding up pointing to that but after a while, after so many things came down the pike, uh, I just got to the point where I'd, I'd start laughing. You know, they were kind of like expecting, you know, what's going to come next? Uh, I have a hard head, and uh, I have the uh, logical mind and how things work and, and so on. Like being assistant chief on the fire department, you've got to do a lot of work in your head about where the fire is, and where you're going to put the people and all that stuff and everything. So, and uh, uh, what, what will cause something else? So I was trying to explain these things that were happening to me. 
But the more they happened, uh, it got to a point, and I tell people I was not only, not only being shown that uh, reincarnation, I was beaten, beaten over the head with it. There were some things that happened. One, there was you were in a barracks, and this person, the man, came up to you and said hi, and then you realized you could see through him. He was transparent, and it took you all to figure out who the guy was. Well, he didn't really say hi. I, I did. <laughs> 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 and, and what it was, I wasn't to find out later until later on after all this Gordon stuff came out, who it was that had walked in my barracks room. Because this is down in Florida. The rooms were quite hot. That was This is back in the 60s. They didn't provide air conditioning for the military. You know, you had a central fan in the middle of the hall, so everybody kept their doors and windows open. Had the fan going in the hall, so the air had flowed through the barracks. Well, one night as I was just about to go to sleep, I noticed somebody walked into the room from the hallway and stood at the end of the bed. I had to lean out from the bed to kind of see them a little bit. So I said, hey, what's going on? Just And I noticed as I was talking to him that I could see the picture on the wall that was directly behind him. So I was, <laughs> I was looking through him. So when that happened, I kind of pulled my knees up toward my chest and twisted over to the side of the bed, stood up and walked out the door and went down the hall and watched uh, uh, some TV with some of the guys. Hey, what are you doing? You know, I watched TV with you guys for a while and everything. After a while, I figured, what, what was it? Maybe my imagination went up. So I walked back down to my room. Now the door was still open. And as I get down to the room, the man standing in the door. So I walked past him, turned around, went back and said, I think I'm going to watch some more TV with you guys. But his looks were, I explained it, sort of like uh, Abraham Lincoln-ish, you know, toward the end of Lincoln's life when his uh, uh, kind of gaunt looking, you know, hollow cheeks and stuff. The thing is with Gordon, even Gordon sometimes, you see the, the pictures of him, he doesn't look like himself because he was uh, wounded so many times and he had about a dysentery for quite a few weeks, and uh, so he, he was quite thin and everything. He, he came back pretty good, but uh, when I saw some of those pictures, it dawned on me who that was in my room, and it was Gordon. So you want to talk about being be someone being besides themselves? That's what happened. Now, how that all came about, don't ask me. I, I guess it's supposed to be one of those triggers that put you, or, or you remember things like that, like my hospital visit with the, with the wounds that mimicked Gordon's, Gordon's wounding. You remember those things, so they all go in the in the uh, file bank there. So, you, at a later date, you know they kind of fit in with the other pieces. Well, in the previous interview, we talked about your meditation, the techniques, and the things that you did. And in some cases, reading your story, you said you actually wanted some help because some of those memories were kind of um, messy. Maybe is the way I'm going to say it. And so, you wanted some help, guidance after you started practicing the meditation to kind of, I guess, trigger or direct it a certain way. Can you explain how this worked for you? It's quite simple. I wanted to kind of like protect myself from any evil, not leave myself open. I, I had gone to see Gene Loomis, who uh, showed me meditation, and I, she was trying to get me ready to do a past life regression like the, for the next time that we met. And, but I found out that I could pull up things rather easily, so much so that uh, I really didn't need the past life regression. Plus, I didn't want it because I, I, I can't help it. I'm, maybe I'm a control freak or something. I don't like giving up control. So uh, learning how to meditation, and she said, you know, I said, yeah, anything I can do to you know, protect myself? Well, she said, surround yourself with white light and that type of thing. What it boiled down to is, for some reason, sometimes, once in a while, rarely, I would pull up something where I was actually in the scene, okay? Not looking at it, but actually in it. Now, I have to remember, this stuff is coming at me fast and furious, kind of, and I'm, I was a little leery of the whole thing. But, well, as an example, one time I, I, was, I was on a horse. I keep going back to horses and these things sometimes. On a horse, I've got buff-colored gloves on, and a rider comes up, Confederate soldier, throws a salute, hands a note over, and I read the open note and read it, and it said, take the men to Gettysburg, you know, and that's it. And I put the note in my shirt. 
Now, back during the Civil War, most of the clothing, um, they didn't have pockets. You know, a lot of times they carried things on uh, uh, like little purses hanging off of things and so on. So they would, I imagine a lot of times the officers would stick the envelopes or whatever in their shirts and stuff to hang on to them so they don't lose them. So anyway, that carried over to the fire department. I did that all through my career in the fire department. So now I'm thinking, I'm questioning myself because I'm saying if somebody asks you to name a battle of, in the Civil War, what are they going to say? Probably 99 times out of 100, they're going to say Gettysburg. So I'm saying, I'm, I must be imagining this. I must be, I don't know. I said, why is Gordon, why is he off by himself with the guys? Why isn't he with the rest of the army and stuff? Well, I was to find out uh, quite a while later and some writings on the Civil War and everything that uh, General Early, and, and along with Gordon's men, Gordon was under Early, went out and captured York, Pennsylvania. Gordon went on a little farther ahead and went to Wrightsville. They were going to try to go across the bridge there. It was a 100, it was one mile long covered bridge. Big covered bridge, we're talking. Well, anyway, the Union troops that were there couldn't stop Gordon's force, so they lit the bridge on fire and backed across back over to the other side of the river. Gordon's men actually saved Wrightsville by putting out the fire, but uh, so what after all that was over and they're going back the other way. I read that uh, Gordon was in the van, so what that meant was they reunited with all of uh, Gurley's men. Gordon was sent ahead of everybody else with his men, so he's in the van, not not the motor vehicle, but he's in the forward position. And they were heading for Cashtown until a courier came to him and gave him a, the message to take the men to Gettysburg. So what I had seen actually had transpired. That's just one experience. And the reason you've been asked to share your story so many times in so many venues is because of your recollections. And then you also, there are other past lives that as you begin to meditate, you picked up on these other lives. Do you want to just fill us in on that? I didn't take anything as being uh, correct. I would get something, and I'd know that, write it down, remember it, and I wouldn't give any credence to it until I received at least two more verifications or two more validations from other sources. So at that time, along with the meditations, I would once in a while, very rarely, but once in a while, uh, go to head psychic fairs around. And there was one woman that was supposed to be Tops, Yvonne Smith. She was supposed to be the tops of those people. And I would only go and see her until later on. I actually stopped and saw some other people. I would go and see her. And um, uh, as an example, uh, let's, let's do the samurai. I had had uh, visions of being samurai, being Japanese, seeing the armor, you know, the wood sort of like a Ninja Turtle type <laughs> outfit type thing. Uh, they weren't very long. Um, one time I saw a, a woman, pretty woman. All I could see was like put her eyes up because she had her hand held forward and was holding a pearl. I always called her the pearl. Long story, I'm not going to go into it because I'll probably get in trouble with my wife, but I actually met this woman, the pearl, in, in, in this life. But... Um, I went and uh, was talking to Yvonne. She says, what do you want today? I said, uh, just see if you can hit it on some past lives. And about the second one in, she starts talking about Japan. She says, you're a samurai. She says, you're a very good samurai. You're, you're, you're very, very talented. She said, but very ugly, too. A big <laughs> top knot on your head and all that. I said, oh, okay, well, we can't be handsome all the time. <laughs> so... Uh, she talked a little bit about that. Okay, so I had, during meditation, that vision. Yvonne came up with that without any coaxing or anything else. But the best one, my favorite of all time verification, was a little boy at Borders Bookstore over in uh, Stanford, 
my wife and I used to go over there a lot. She would go to the baking section. She loves to cook and bake. I would go to the history section. Now, it was like a, a couple rows of books, and I'm standing between them in the history section. And down at the end of the book uh, shelves, a uh, man, woman, little child came in. The child had to be about, I'd say, five. And the man's talking to the woman. I don't know if it's his wife or girlfriend or whatever, but it's quite obvious he wants her to take care of the kid while he goes off and does his thing and sees his stuff or whatever. So she finds a book, and it's on airplanes, and they're sitting down on the floor, and the little boy's sitting there, and I'm looking at him, and he's about 15 feet away, and I'm looking at him, and I say, that's a cute little kid. He's making the airplane noises and stuff, and she's turning the pages. And all of a sudden, he picks his head up and looks at me, but not really at me, sort of like through me. And he says one word. He says, samurai. And the woman says to him, what did you say? He says, samurai. He said, what is that? She said, oh, it's a sword. She said, where do you see that? He said, he said, nowhere. What is that? She says, well, it's, it's like a sword and all that. And after the hair on the back of my neck went back down, I'm saying this has got to be some sort of soul recognition thing. I went over and talked to him and was explaining the samurai was a person and they carried these different swords and everything. But that was my third validation for the samurai. And that's amazing. That's out of nowhere. A yeah. five-year-old kid. And I'm looking around for books with pictures of samurai or ninja turtles or anything. And I'm saying he pronounced it right. He didn't know what it was. And, and he looked right through me. I said, oh, man. The only audio experience, the only time I ever heard something, and I mean heard it. It wasn't internal. I mean heard it. I'm down at the stop and shop grocery store. I'm going to park. I'm pulling down the aisle. And I see somebody coming up. I was going to take a slot that was near me to park in, but this other person was coming the other way. I, I stop. I'm, go I'm going to let them have that because I see somebody farther down backing out. I said, I'll let them take this. I'll take the other spot. So I went in and I pulled in the other spot. And just as I shut off the car, it was just like somebody was in the back seat. Uh, a commanding voice, a strong voice that said, Fusilier. And I look in the mirror and I look around the car and nothing. And I just put my head down on the steering wheel and I'm going, oh, man. <laughs> now, I understood at that time that a fusilier had something to do with the military. Now, I was trying to figure it out. So I, I looked up fusiliers and uh, there were, that was an old, uh, they, were, they carried fusils, which were lightweight muskets. But that, designation in the military carried on through the years and they had that designation even though there was no more muskets and stuff like that so it was more modern day too and they had uh, you know the epaulets on the shoulders the uh, cloth piece that goes across on each shoulder mm -hmm. of the military uniforms the fusiliers were it's distinctive that they didn't have a single one they had like a double one and I'm saying okay that makes sense this voice trying to get my attention and all from behind, not knowing my name, but being familiar with uniforms, would see the Fusilier epaulets and call out Fusilier. I said, it all makes sense. Plus, I also had some uh, meditations. One of the ones I told you was sort of like a profound meditation. One of the ones where I actually <laughs> was in the scene mm -hmm. and it scared the hell out of me. I jumped. I was, I was laying on the couch. And all of a sudden, there was a big noise. And what it turned out to be was an engine on a uh, fighter bomber known as a uh, Martin Marauder. It was a, started on one side, and I jumped. I grabbed, I grabbed onto the couch. And then I was inside the, the fuselage, and I could see the pilot, the co-pilot, up from where I was and everything. Then the engine started on the other side. Sometimes those things didn't last that long, but they... They were like a gut punch. They'd hit you, you bam, and wow. Now, funny things keep happening that people would call coincidence and everything. I was to later find out there was only one existing Martin Marauder left from World War II that was still flying. 
And you want to know who owned it? Who? The Confederate Air Force. There was a group of men that were trying to save the old airplanes and everything, and they were down, down south. You know, it's nice to be in the warm weather to keep everything more rust-free and all that. And they were known as the Confederate Air Force. Another hit with yeah. you. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. They did change their name, though. They, what do they call it nowadays, being woke? They got rid of that. They changed their name to something mm-hmm. else more more suitable to others, let's put it that way. Well, when you're doing your research and you're having these memories, you have managed to nail the several past lives and get details. But the thing about it is it's military. A lot of it, but there was also very short things that I had were uh, like lifetimes. I guess I needed them in between the other lifetimes. Uh, Franciscan friar, uh, Tibetan monk. Uh, there was Native Americans. Uh, but also you get into Native American, you could get into that warrior spirit and all. And, and with these past lives, the ones I've set the names to you and everything, uh, I think I tell people it's not so important who you were, but what you were. And I notice it's interesting with these past lives. I also tell people it, past lives are a nice, nice place to visit, but you don't want to live there. Yeah. Okay, Some people do that. It's like a common thread, a common theme working through the, the, different, uh, the different lifetimes. Uh, now, with, with John Gordon, if you remember, and, and, and you got to ask everybody just to keep this in the back of their head for a moment, that when Gordon was wounded, he was so severely wounded at Antietam, he shot five times, shot through the face, should have died. He didn't. His wife kept him going. She was uh, not too far from the battlefield and, and was brought up to take care of him. She kept him alive because his jaw was uh, wired shut and mobilized because he got shot in the face. He had to have <laughs> lose, lost some teeth and um, had his jugular so severed, so they wanted to keep him immobilized. So now his teeth are shut, and the only thing she could do was she gave him a uh, brandy, I think it was, and uh, beef tea, which is made out of boiling the beef meat down so it was thin enough so he could he could yeah. get it through his teeth to, to keep going. She kept him, she, she saved his life. If he hadn't been there, he, he would have been a goner. That sounds like almost but, like a medicinal with the alcohol there and then the, the protein with the broth. So, boy, brilliant. With Gordon, we have that with the wounding of the face, and, and you already know my story about going over to the uh, hospital on my 30th birthday with the pain in my face and jaw and shoulder and everything. Well, my jaw has always been misaligned. Uh, some of the dentists are amazed at how I can chew food so well with uh, my lower teeth have a lingual inclination, they would call it. They lean backwards a little bit. But also through my life be- before that, I was having I was having jaw trouble and everything. They thought I had uh, TMJ and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to come home from school one time. I was in school, middle school. And it was art class and I was painting, I was doing something in painting and the brush and I went right across the page. I actually lost sight in one eye and didn't feel good and uh, ended up going home and my grandmother came and picked me up. That happened two or three times and most of the time that was like the beginning of the school year, so they think, you know, people are thinking, maybe the parents are thinking, hey, he wants to get out of school, he doesn't like school, that type of thing. But the thing is, if remember back from Gordon, he was wounded at uh, Antietam, and it was on September 17th. When I started school, each time I started school, it was always in September, so it was around that time, so that might have, that might have played into it, looking, looking back on it. Who was it who had the grains of was it Grain of salt method it was Thomas Edison. He was a great thinker and everything, but a lot of the stuff that's attributed to him and all that actually came out of his factory where he had people working for him. He had people working for him like Tesla mm-hmm. and people of that caliber. And, of course, it being his company, everything you take credit for. It. He even got in a fight with Tesla over which was better, AC or DC. And Absolutely. All that stuff. When he would do his like meditation type things, that's, that's what I want to explain to people. It's really meditations and then sometimes just before you go to sleep at night or just before you wake up in the morning that rate that in between and what he would do is he had like a little reclining chair I guess and then have his arm on the chair with the BBs in it and then a plate under a copper plate or something underneath the his hand so if he started to doze off 
he would loosen his grip and the BBs would fall in the, in the, in the can or tray and then wake him up again. It's not easy to do because I think I've said to you one time, you know, sometimes uh, it just turned out I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people, that's the problem. And so I, when I saw that, I thought that's a great little trick. Yeah, and it's not too hard to uh, replicate either. I mean, but you, you get a few BBs and you get a dish or something <laughs> and somehow hook it to underneath where your hand's going to be and you're, you're all set. Jeffrey Keene's most obvious connection is with the Gordon character. But as he began to meditate more and continue to delve into that, he discovered other past lives as well. Again, the first interview with Jeffrey Keene is in the archives. Fire in the soul. Jeffrey says he did not do the past life regression. There was a reason for that. Some of the advice he got and insight from psychics was helpful, though. So we're going to cover that in this part, the second interview with Jeffrey Keene. Sometimes when I went to the psychics, they would say things that uh, would just get me shaking my head and all. And one psychic said, I don't know if it was Yvonne, but they said, you might want to ask yourself why you're in Connecticut. I said, okay. And then another one later on uh, in the years when I started working on the book and everything, sat down in front of her, tarot card reader. And she said, hi. I said, hi. And she's just looking at me and shuffling the cards. She said, you're a writer. No. She said, yeah, you're a writer. You're going to write a book. Then I confessed to her, well, listen, I'm dyslexic. I type with two fingers. I'm working on a thing now. You know, it's just a She says, two books. I said, no, no, please, come on, no. Yep, she said, two books. And she added a movie. Well, so far we've got the two books. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not the movie. But my book is on a man's desk that's out there in California, and it may happen, so who knows. Oh, cross fingers. But, well, it's a great story. It's a great story. That that part of it has to do with the, the multitude of, of connections that you are able to make and your extreme resemblance when you put a picture side by side and you see the two of you it's just absolutely extraordinary to see all of you know that that look that man here he is again a little bit of history come to life there civil war now i can go that one better remember the woman said you might want to think about your here in connecticut yeah well i kind of thought that a little bit anyway i came across a book on um, israel putnam now, a lot of people wouldn't recognize the name, but if you recognize the name George Washington and the Revolutionary War, the next person down from George Washington in rank was Israel Putnam. He was a major general. Now, Putnam Park is about uh, 12 miles away from where I lived in Westport. My aunt lived right next to it, right next to the, the ranger's house. And up there at Putnam Park, there is a a statue of Israel Putnam. He was at Knapp's Tavern. My mother's maiden name is Knapp. Knapp's Tavern over in Greenwich, Connecticut. The British dragoons were chasing him, and he spurred his horse down what are known as the Hundred Steps. They were carved into a sheer cliff. He took his horse down. He got his hat shot off. He took his horse down that cliff. Now, when Gordon was writing his book, he was trying to get away from the federal soldiers, And the only way he could do that, he spurred his horse down a a very steep embankment. They went tumbling down and ended up both sitting, looking at each other in in the water when they kind of straightened themselves up. And he likened that ride that he did to Putnam's famous ride down the 100 steps. Now, I I lived on Overlook Road. Grew up most of my young life was on Overlook Road in Westport. And my grandfather lived on Hemlock Hill, which was a couple of streets up, and ran up to the same hilltop, up to a road called Broadview. He showed me pictures one time, photographs of that property way back, and it was almost denuded of trees. A lot of the a lot of the country here in the United States didn't have all the trees around it has now. And what had happened was years ago in the uh, during the Revolutionary War, the British landed at Westport. And they broke into two columns and they marched up to Danbury, Connecticut and burnt Danbury. Danbury is where I was born, okay? So 
on the way back, they didn't lose too many men on the way up, but on the way back, the Continental Army and some of the uh, Minutemen and stuff were waiting for him, and it was extremely costly for him, and they never did that again. They never did an inland excursion like that one again because it was just too costly. Now, up at Putnam Park, that was the winter quarters of Israel Putnam's men, and they went up to up near Danbury and saw what was going on and everything and, and didn't want to attack the British outright. So they pulled back. Benedict Arnold had his horse shot out from under up in Richfield. And they, they came back way ahead of the British, got ahead of them. And they set up an ambush for the British because they knew where they had crossed the water, the river, that was on the other side of the, the main road where I lived. If you were up on the top of that hill, it had a commanding view of the river and everything else. They set up to ambush the the British. One of the Tories, that's people that are pro-British, warned them, and they went a different route, went back down to the Campo Beach where the boats were and ended up into a battle at Campo Hill down there. But I grew up on the hill where uh, Israel Putnam's men, under the command of Benedict Arnold, were to set up there to, to attack the British. Now, another thing that adds into that, my grandfather's road was a very steep hill. Now, we know about Putnam's ride. We know about Gordon's ride. But you don't know about Jeffrey's ride. <laughs> I was up at my grandfather's house with my brother and a friend. My brother and his friend had English bikes, which had the grip uh, brakes on the, on the hand grip. I had a little American bike, which, if people can remember, ever rode one of those, the braking system was you had to step on the pedal when it was back. That was the brake. So they took off down the steep hill. I took off after them. I couldn't keep my legs going fast enough, so I took my legs, feet off the pedals. Now I'm in trouble. I'm halfway down the hill. I can't get my feet back on the pedals. And I must have been doing 35 or more. And I figured I'm going to go across the street and into a tree or something over there. But I didn't hit a tree because I never got to it. I hit a car. <laughs> I, hit the dri- I hit the driver's door of a local police sergeant's wife's car. Bent the bike around my leg. Actually, in front of the bike, the tire and everything the stuff was wrapped around my legs. And, of course, I scared the hell out of her, Mrs. DiMatteo. I scared her. And uh, I... I, she said, you're all right, and everything. She was all shook up, and I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm taking my bike. I took the bike, and I went home, and uh, later on, her husband and uh, another police officer showed up, and they saw that I was okay and everything, and I kept telling them, I didn't hit the car. I didn't hit the car. I told my father, I didn't hit the car. He went up and looked at the car, and he came back. That day, I had had on a shirt that had, like, you want to call them pimples or something? They're Pimples are in. These are called these pimples. They stuck up. There was bumps all over the shirt. My father looked at the door of her car where the dent was, and all around that were the marks from my shirt. Okay, so Putnam had his ride, and, and, and Gordon had his, and I had mine. <laughs> That's an intense hit. Now, now we'll even add a little more to that. Why I have this, the second lifetime after Gordon's, the one I feel the strongest about, is Israel Putnam's. But I left that out. When I first years ago saw what I was reading, I, I put the book away. I didn't want to look at it anymore because one major general at a time was like enough for me. But over the years, I've uh, studied a little bit more and found out some more stuff. Now, uh, does the name uh, Aaron Burr ring a bell? Yeah. Aaron Burr, for those that don't know, was the third vice president of the United States under uh, um, with Jefferson. Also, he was in the Revolutionary War, and he was an aide to General Washington. Aaron Burr was like his own worst enemy sometimes. He was extre- he was brilliant. He was really a genius and stuff, but he tended to rub people the wrong way. Well, Washington wanted to get, get rid of him, so he gave him to General Putnam. Aaron Burr was General Putnam's aide to camp, one of his aide to camps. Now, Remember I said my grandfather lived on Hemlock Hill? Yeah. His second wife's maiden name was Burr, Grace Burr. And her mother, Lottie Burr, who I used to 
babysit for her sometimes. And when I was only about six or eight years old, they just wanted me to make sure she was all right and bring her water. Because this woman was like ancient and blind. And Lottie Burr and my grandmother were, uh, guess who they're related to? They're related to Aaron Burr. It's a small world. Oh, it gets even smaller. My mother always admired a uh, uh, eagle eagle pin that my grandmother wore all the time. She always said, oh, Grace, oh, that's so pretty. And she said, Josie, when I'm gone, it's yours. Now, my grandmother passed away. Uh, her sister, Betsy, was uh, around the place, and my mother was asking about the eagle pin. You know, Grace said I could have that eagle pin. Now, uh, my great aunt Bessie is a swamp Yankee penny pincher. You know, they saved uh, paper clips and things like that, string and all. She rummaged around in a desk. I think she knew what exactly what pen my mother was talking about. But rummaged around in a desk and got this thing like dark copper, dark brown and all, and it had an eagle on it. She said, "Well, here's the thing with an eagle. You know, it was bent and everything," and gave it to my mother. Well, my mother kept it. She almost sold it one time at a flea market. My father said, what are you doing? She said, a guy said, give me five bucks for it. I said, he, my father said, I'll give you five bucks for it. And he grabbed it and took it away from her. <laughs> gave, her the, gave her the five dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, he, he was a numismatist. He collected coins and all. Now, this was a button. But one day, he got a, mag- he got a magazine, uh, the numismatic magazine, a, a, a newspaper. And guess what's on the cover that button that button was from george washington's inauguration i still have it <laughs> it's right now it's worth about three or four thousand dollars <laughs> yeah, i an think it's, it's, worth, it's probably worth a lot more than that eagle pen that my great aunt uh, bessie wouldn't uh, give her mm-hmm. but on it is his memorable and the date march whatever for the inauguration but the date is wrong because uh Washington wasn't sworn in then. He went back to, there was something he had to attend to back at uh, uh, Mount Vernon. And then he came back to New York to be sworn in. But uh, there were very few, very few of these buttons made. They were made in different metals and stuff. But uh, Well, the, yeah. in, the interesting that? thing is that you seem to be able to get these kinds of artifacts that, that are a testament to your history, your previous lives. The, I'm a magnet. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> obvi- magnet. obviously. So when you talk to people, because you have counseled people in different groups about their own past life experiences, what is the takeaway what, from remembering this? How does it help people? Um, over the years, not too often, but I, I'll get uh, emails and stuff where it, uh, uh, the people read the book or saw the stories and so on, and it helped them with their uh, things they were thinking about and worrying about and what to do and where to go and, and all that type of stuff. And I keep telling them all the time now, before you do uh, past life regression, because I've seen a lot of those, a lot of people that do that are great. Other people, they kind of lead people and so on. And that was the thing I didn't want to have. I didn't want to be led. I wanted things to come to me myself. And I tell people that you're the best expert on you. So it doesn't cost anything to just uh, try to remember when you're waking up in the morning, a lot of those uh, those areas in between, you know, sleep and awake. If you come up with something, write it down. Uh, meditations, uh, if you see something, write it down. I don't care if it's a, uh, one time I saw some like flight wings uh, upside down. I, I would draw pictures of them. Sometimes you might get numbers or uh, uh, just anything, uh, songs, just Write this stuff down. You can always later refer back to it. But uh, I think the reincarnation is coming a bit more acceptable because I told people I did interviews many years ago. I did one with uh, uh, paranormal, paranormal universe of like and they were on the uh, they were on the internet, and they want after they heard my story and everything. They said, "What do you what do you see for the future?" And I told them at that time, and now this was back in probably 2003, I said, we've advanced too much technologically and not enough spiritually. So that's going to change. I said, then 
people are going to find out that uh, some of the things that came out of uh, the, the Bible, stuff like that, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself and do unto others, you know, the very simple stuff. Take away all the smoke and mirrors and candles and incense and stuff like that and look at the, the, the main body and, and those little nuggets of gold there. Because if you think about it, we're all, we're all traveling the same highway here. Actually, your neighbor is you. You can look at them that way because we came from the same source, okay? And they're going through their experience. And the golden rule, you don't really need to explain that too much, you know, do yeah. unto other people who you have been done unto you. So that's a good thing to live by. But I said also we're going to go into a very bad time, very bad. And we're going to need each other more than ever. We're in that now. If you look around the world, we're in that now. We're actually in a world war, but people don't realize it. But if you see the things like it happened in Brazil or over in some of the European countries and stuff like that, or even in our own country, uh, United States, we're going to get we're going to get things straightened out here, and there are a lot of truths are going to come out, and a lot of truths the people won't be able to deny, but and they won't like it. And they won't look at it. And a lot of people are going to lose their lives because a lot of people are going to be pissed off by what's been kept from us over the years and how we've been kept in the dark. Uh, I actually heard one person, and I believe she was probably true, said, right now, forget everything you were taught and then wait for the future and watch because they have lied to us. Our governments have lied to us. People around the world have lied to us about everything about the Bibles, uh, about the uh, history, mathematics, physics, anything, any subject you can think of, they've lied to us about it. Uh, withholding medical practices that would have saved just thousands and thousands, maybe millions of lives, withheld from us, you know. It doesn't make money. That, that, yeah. That's going to tend to get people very angry when they find out that maybe their loved one's death was caused, start out caused by these bad people, or was prevented from being helped from the restriction of the medications and treatment and stuff that's available for people. Would you be upset if you were told that uh, they had a cure for many of the cancers more than 70 years ago? Um, I pretty much figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that stuff's going to come out, and I hope, and I hope the good people restrain themselves somewhat and let justice take care of uh, take care of the evil doers. <laughs> well, some of it is again, you know, you're asking people to do their own discernment of you can you can react, and if you react with anger, that's really self defeating. But if you react with intention and how can I improve rather than um, just go out and pitch a fit and stand in the street and, you know, cry and moan, instead of doing that kind of stuff, be proactive instead of reactive. And that's where I think we're going to turn the corner and start realizing that some of this stuff is self-defeating and hitting somebody else or going after somebody else and, and retaliation, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. It doesn't do a, a service. It's, okay, how it's do we gonna, get it, this stuff to the forefront and go forward? The, the bad part, it's going to come back on the person that's angry and yeah. does the bad act. Uh, they're going to be the one going to jail or whatever and it, suffering for, you know, and that you, so you do have some information in terms of that insight. Did that come to you through meditation? Partly. I saw the, I saw the Twin Tower fire before it happened. Uh, at a distance. I wrote about it in a book. Mm -hmm. Little things like that. Uh, a lot of it comes from over 20 years of observing different governments and things going on in the world and, uh, pay attention to, to different things, the finance, uh, financial world and things like that. Uh, uh, that's coming down the pike, too. You can see a change in finance. But if it works out, believe it or not, we have some white hats. You want to call them the alliance or whatever, the good people. There are good people that are working in the background that we don't see that are actually giving their lives to try to save the, the country and everything with the, with the things they have to do and the people they have to go up against. Uh, 
they're going to try to do a smooth transition in the monetary system, uh, which also also enters into Gordon's life. Gordon, back when he was a senator, there was a couple areas that uh, he worked on. He was on a committee that tried to straighten out the uh, 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 Rutherford B. Hayes Tilden uh, presidential thing. It was real close. They gave it to Hayes. Tilden really won it. He was a Democrat. So they found out he won it, but it was so close to the end of the Civil War, they didn't want to start up again, so they figured they would give it to Hayes, but nothing for nothing. So they went saw Hayes' people, as they say, and what they did was they made some deals, one of the deals being the, uh, the government would pull the last of the federal troops out of the, out of the South because they were like uh, under martial law down there for a long time. They mm-hmm. pulled them out of South Carolina. Now, another thing that happened back then, there wasn't enough gold to cover the money. Now, gold is real money, the, and it backed the U.S. dollar. But gold was scarce, scarce, so they were coming up with more dollars than gold. And what you're supposed to do is you have enough gold to cover the if you wanted to at that time, you could actually go and turn your gold certificate in and they would give you physical gold. So it was back. That was real money back then. Mm. We were the last, we were the last holdout. Everybody else was fiat currency it was sort of just like a note saying everybody's going to agree this money, but our money was backed. But back at that time, they wanted to add, uh, some people wanted to add silver to that silver being more plentiful. They could, bring that in and help back up the gold and all that. And there was a big argument about it. Uh, William Jennings Bryant had one of the most famous speeches of all time in the United States about being crucified on a cross of gold. Well, anyway, w- one of the people that was also working on that buy metals backing of the money was Gordon. That might be coming down the pike. And if you remember, we also had a presidential uh, election with Gore, Gore and uh, and Bush with the hanging chads and all that. Remember they had to yes. straight that out? Yeah. So history doesn't always completely repeat itself, but it sure the hell does rhyme. <laughs> now, if you want a little more history lesson, uh, you remember my facial problems. You remember uh, uh, Gordon's facial problems. Now we'll go back to Putnam. Putnam Actually, Gordon, you know, was worked for both the North and the South. He was a Confederate, but later on became a senator. And uh, uh, one, I remember one author wrote that he was one of the uh, most important people in the last half of that century, not having to do anything with the fighting in the Civil War. But he had a speech, uh, Last Days of the Confederacy, where he went around in his book and everything, trying to, like, reunite the North and the South. Mm-hmm. Putnam also, at one time, fought with fought alongside the British in the French and Indian War, and then later on in the Continental Army. But when he was in the uh, uh, French and Indian War, he was captured by a very large uh, Mohawk Indian. Uh, his gun misfired, and the guy got a hold of him. That was it. They carted him off, um, and later on, they. The Mohawks were playing with him, had him tied to a tree, and light, trying to light fires around his feet. And uh, one uh, Mohawk threw a tomahawk at his head and missed his hitting him in the head, but cut his cheek. Okay? So he had a big scar across his cheek. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Placement. <laughs> he, also, he also was hit in the face by a, Brit, uh, uh, a French soldier. Uh, hit, hit him in the face with a gun butt. So one of the uh, French officers came along and saw what they were doing and everything, kind of took pity out of it. It, it. it knocked the fire away and said, cut it out, guys. And he took Putnam and he gave him back to the big Indian to take care of. Now Putnam being hit with a tomahawk and smashed in the face and everything, like, he couldn't eat. He was, he was, he was near death. He could he couldn't, they had hard tack back then. You know, it was very hard to, to break it. Mm. He couldn't chew it. He couldn't eat. The Indian, the big Indian that captured him, took the hard tack and all that, took the stuff that was tried to eat and he soaked it and he softened everything and he kept 
feeding them, and he kept them alive. And it turns out uh, that good deeds do pay off sometimes, because later on at the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga, the shoe was on the other foot. It came across the Indian there living in one of the houses with his family, and Putnam saw him and gave everybody orders that that man, that family, that house is not to be disturbed. Yeah. What goes around comes around. I think you're doing a great service for people who've had these experiences and, you know, just a corroboration of this isn't pie in the sky. These things happen. Reincarnation is real. And you're basically an authority who can give some credence to all of this. And I think that's that's what we need. <laughs> I don't know if I'm an authority. I, I'm an experiencer, let's put it that way. And I will give everybody one good tip of advice besides the other stuff that, stuff that I said earlier about, uh, you know, don't get too involved in your past lives and, and it's not so important who you were but what you were. I see an awful lot of people trying to find their soulmates. They just want to find their soulmates and they're like, if that happens, everything will be fine and their lives are so messed up and everything. Well, the best way to find your soulmate is not to look. And don't think you have only have uh, one soulmate. You've had a lot of them. If you've had more than one life, you've probably had a lot of them. And they're just good friends and sweethearts and, and fellow actors and stuff like that. The best way to attract a soulmate, because you have a you have a, a, a script when you come down here, the things you're supposed to do. I'm doing the, one of the things right now by talking to you, writing the book and all that. But what you could do, the best way to find your soulmate is stop looking, straighten yourself up. Because if you figure that you're a mess, who else coming along wants to take care of that mess that you are now? Straighten yourself up as much as you can. Take care of yourself. Try to stay healthy and all that. Go about your business, and most likely you're going to run into somebody that people might term a soulmate. It happened to me. She saved my life. When I met her, I weighed 159 pounds. I hadn't been into 150 since high school. Over six feet tall and into one fifty, so I was a bean pole, and a, and she's a gourmet cook and baker, and I gained sixty pounds after meeting her. <laughs> but when it first started going out with her, I was explaining to her that I didn't want to get married again, I didn't want to get involved, and all, and she just kept, yep, okay, yep, okay. <laughs> but uh, then I knew I was really sunk one time because when I first went out with her, uh, took her back home and everything, and then. It, going through the divorce and losing all that weight and all the stuff that was going on. A couple of weeks went by and I said, I really, I'd really like to go see that lady again. It, it's strange how it came about, how we met too. Uh, it wasn't just coincidence. I met her at a, a restaurant and I was always sitting at the table and when she walked toward the table, I said, I'm dead meat. She had a beautiful dress on. She's a pretty lady, beautiful dress on with these big, had big flowers on it. Uh, Gardenias, I guess they were. And after I was hooked, and we've been married uh, 32 years now, in one of the stories I read about Gordon when he first met his wife, Fanny, she had a gardenia and it stuck in her ear. You can't get away from it. There's just no way. No. no. Which says there's a higher power and a plan that's working all along, and we're lucky if we see behind the scenes. You have seen behind the scenes. The book is available through your website, jeffreykeen.com and the, I'm hoping that they will do a movie because it's another way for people to see the story. In the meantime, though, your story is available. That, Like I said, the unexplained, that's where I saw it. You also have a video on your website that people can check out. Isn't that from Proof Positive? Yep. Okay. All right. Anything before we close? Not unless you could get Brad Pitt to do the lead in the movie. <laughs> He's in demand. I'm sure he'll consider it, okay? <laughs> He's probably looking forward to doing something just like that and hasn't been approached, so we'll cross our fingers. Yeah, it would make a good film, though. A really good story. Yeah. The book Fire in the Soul, available on Amazon. I'll put links in the description for the show. Again, the first interview with Jeffrey Keene is in the archives. Thanks for listening.